Morning everyone. It's uh, Charlie Beach here on another sunny day from uh, the Scottish borders. We're in Kelso and we're walking up the big drive towards Floors Castle. Now, don't be deceived by the name. It's a huge countryside mansion built by some very rich people 300 years ago and it's named the castle because it's made to look like a castle. Now, it's a scene for movies and TV shows and there's always a good vibe here. You're not going to get blocked in or chased off by inbred local people cleaning their shotguns. This is a National Trust Scottish Heritage Site and visitors are very welcome. If you pull a camera out here, start walking around, they're like, hooray, it's working. We built it and they will come. So today, there's the River Tweed that goes through. Kelso today guys a peaceful video and I want to talk about uh, you guys and, and your amazing reaction to my uh, my sad video yesterday hey hey shadow hey shadow youngie and self let's make peace yeah what I've always loved about wild and uh, remote Scotland is that uh, there's a subspecies of feral children that has uh, been running around in the wild since the highland, highland clearances of the 17th and 18th centuries. So I'm going to try and capture one of these uh, creatures on camera, but uh, i got to be very careful, guys. I've got my vest and my gloves on because these kids, they're, they're only about three foot tall, but they're, they're proper orky little scary creatures. So let's go and have a look. Okay, I think I heard some feral children in the bush, but uh, the roads changed. After those two traffic cones, there is the freshest laid down tarmac and bitumen and uh, gravel. It's still sticky. Ew, and it smells. You know when you pass those uh, tarmac boiling vans on the road when they're fixing the roads? That's what it smells like. Very incongruous to the nature around here having this bloody highway oh my goodness look at that view guys coming around the front of Floors Castle. It's a proper house. Now, just to give you the history, it was built in 1720 for the Duke of Roxburgh. And so obviously it's a hereditary peer. The Duke was uh, living here. It was then renovated in the 1900s, sorry, 19th century, 1800s, by William Playfair with turrets and bits and bobs to make it look more castle-y. So, uh, yeah, you can almost see where the bricks change, where they added the turrets. You can see it there. What is a song thrush without song? It's just thrush, and no one likes thrush. This is how the other half, or should we say the 1% used to live in the past. Now, uh, like we saw at Carham Hall, modern, modern aristocrats struggle with the upkeep. Uh, too many wars have been fought for rights and workers' rights, and you can't pay people a pittance or slave wages. And uh, yeah, it's kind of looked down upon when you try and trap the peasantry on your land as well and it creates all sorts of aggravation. But uh, this is now National Trust, Scottish heritage, and it's actually designed for what I'm doing right now, for people to walk around and look at it. Now this here, guys, this, uh, you can tell, this is very recently renovated. Let's get around so you don't get the contrast, but there's some shrapnel holes on it. What the hell? There's Kelso behind the bush. You can see the church spire. That's one of the churches. And we'll come around. You see the River Tweed. There's lots of sheep grazing. There's hills. 
come around slowly because otherwise you pan too quickly. It doesn't look good. Doesn't everything just look amazing in the sun? I mean, this building would look great in the bad weather as well, but uh, yeah, the sun maketh the building. So ornate. And they still have tulips in the big vases. Which I like. Here's the very front of the house. Go around and have a look. There's some very nice gardens here as well, walled in gardens, but uh, I think you have to pay. And I'm a bit broke these days. It is fitting, you know, two Range Rovers. I wouldn't expect anything less. Very British. Thank you, everyone. I, uh, I was overwhelmed and I still am to a certain extent. Um, overwhelmed and touched by your response to my video which I wasn't going to post it's too honest it was I was scared but uh, thank you everyone it uh, means the world to me um, every single one of you that wrote to me either in comments or to my email I read every single one and thank you and uh, you're all amazing and I mean that it's no hyperbole I... One thing you'll notice here in Scotland is just how common pheasants are. You maybe can't see it there in the foreground. Let's, there he is. Go on, pheasant. That's a male one, obviously, with the kind of metallic green head. All right, okay. Now, I just want to come along and say hello to the horse because behold, a pale horse. Behold, a friendly brown horse. There's a sign saying, don't touch the horses. Seems a bit, you know, mean. This is a horse can make up his own mind. You want to sniff my hand? Go on, have it. Have a sniff. Now, don't bite it. Good horse. <laughs> You're a good horsey. Why can't people be as nice as friendly horses and doggies and catties, kitties? You're a good horse. Let's go say hello to the pale one. All right. That stupid pheasant. You know, like on the drive up here on the A7, had to like slow down for about three pheasants because they, they, they don't understand. They will literally run in front of your car. Poor pheasants. <clears throat> Wait, let's just have a quick look. The grounds here are immense. There's like a, a 10 foot wall all around the estate of Flores Castle. And uh, there's a lot of um, small cottages as well, you know, the people that work here. And it's all very well to do. Never had any bad vibes here. Hello. It's a good horsey. Do you want to get a sniff? Don't bite. Don't bite. Just use your big, big fat lips just to say hello. Dude, why the long face? What have you got to be sad about? No, don't bite me. Don't bite me. Be nice. Good horse. Look at his hairstyle. He's got the same hair as Boris Johnson. Okay. And a little pony in the background. Brilliant! You can probably hear it in the background, but there's a lot of big heavy machinery doing construction at the back of uh, Flores Castle. It kind of ruins the vibe. And you can probably hear the traffic noise. One thing I always don't notice is how much your brain blocks out white noise from traffic but then when you review the footage later it's like <laughs> you don't realize just how horrific the noise pollution in cities is because your brain manages to, to do noise cancellation you know Have you ever had that thing like in a hot country where you fall asleep and the air conditioning's on and then the thermostat changes the air conditioning goes off and the silence all of a sudden wakes you up because your brain that was blocking out the air conditioner noise suddenly notices a change. One thing I do like in uh, these big walled estates is the horticulture, the botanics, the exciting giant pine trees from North America, all sorts of other trees that you don't normally see. They're all here. You know, the Victorians, the pre-Victorians. <laughs> <laughs> was it George? Was it the madness of King George before Victoria? Probably. 
the Georgians, the Victorians, the Edwardians, they loved the botanic garden. They loved the pagoda. They loved the pine tree. And uh, yeah, you know, you know the aristocrats and the, the secret garden. We'll go down the secret garden path because uh, you had to have your affairs and your premarital sex away from the prying eyes of your contemporaries and especially the servants. So uh, there is a very direct correlation between being rich, having a big garden, and having lots of nooks and crannies in that garden for illicit affairs. Okay, now I'm just talking shit. Let's go. So I saw this sign and I started getting PTSD flashbacks from uh, Karam Hall. Jeez. Ooh. So what I thought were feral children earlier is actually the uh, painful calls of the male pheasant. It actually sounds like someone trying to scream whilst being garroted at the same time. It's like this like guttural... I'll try and capture it on camera. It's in this bush somewhere. And for the uninitiated, for the urban explorer that comes out here, you will think it is the uh, three foot tall feral children with spears. They're like Ewoks, Scottish Ewoks. Gotta be careful. You know, I'm being born in 1980. Um, Turned 18 in 1998. That's around the time the internet went fully mainstream. It's the year that mobile phones went fully mainstream. So I am literally the last generation, not I, people of my age. We are literally the last generation to grow up without social media, internet, mobile phones, instant information. So I feel blessed, you know, 1980 and before you, you grew up normally. And I start often thinking, I've been in conversations with people recently, why are millennials or Zoomers or people younger than me, you know, 25 year olds, 20 year olds, 18 year olds, why are they so sensitive? Why are they so terrified of language? Why are they finding isms everywhere they look? Evil of capitalism, racism, homophobism. It's everywhere. They're finding enemies. It's this permanent victim mentality. I've got a theory. Hear me out. Don't pause, don't touch that dial. <laughs> Hear me out. As we were the last generation to grow up without an overwhelming, around of in overwhelming amount of information, be it good and bad and neutral, and most of it's junk, most of everything's junk. You know, we didn't grow up with um, ISIS beheadings videos. We didn't grow up with gore. We didn't grow up with hardcore pornography. I mean, when I was a teenager, it's the classic. You find the Fiesta. You find, what was it, the other ones? Men Only, whatever, Club Club International. You find these magazines in the bush, in the, in the hedge. Pages stuck together, and you're like... Porn wasn't a big thing when I was a teenager, an adolescent. So your 18-year-olds, your 20-year-olds, your 25-year-olds, even your 30-year-olds grew up on a constant diet, hardcore porn, sexual fetishes, crazy viral videos that edgy teenagers send to each other, whether it's beheadings or blowing people up or, I mean, Jesus. You know, edgy teenagers, it's like, how can you up the ante? Gore, gore, gore. Bad sex, bad sex, bad sex, violent sex. I mean, oh my God, like nowadays, one of the massive search terms in Pornhub is stepdaughter porn, stepbrother porn. Uh, eh? So we grew up without that. We've got this like armor of like, the world is a beautiful place. My childhood was beautiful. I played, I enjoyed the outdoors. I played video games. I played Nintendo 8-bit. I was blown away when I first saw Super Mario World on the 16-bit Super Nintendo. Super Famicom. And uh, so I think if you're like a young teen and you're exposed to hardcore porn, hardcore violence, hardcore gore, crazy ass degenerate music, all sorts of like repetitive hypnotic beats to whatever, make you malleable to whatever bullshit uh, fad they're trying to sell you. I think it's possible that these souls, these young people, they regress, they get terrified. It's like a their mind is under siege and the 
fence around, it shrinks, it gets closer to the center. The demons, the dark, it takes territory and they get shrink, shrink, shrink until they're wanting to ban everything. They want to cancel everyone. They want to deplatform everything just in case, you know, because they say ideas are dangerous, free ideas. It might hurt them. It might remind them of that beheading video that buddy David sent them when they were 11 years old. It's crazy guys. Like, whew. I believe in free speech. I believe in freedom of information, but for little kids, guys, there needs to be extreme censorship. I mean, you don't want, I mean, it's bad enough for me. I avoid video. You know, sometimes people send me something. Oh, look at this rapist in Colombia have his balls torn off by pit bulls. I'm like, what, bro, why the fuck did you send that? I'm not going to fucking watch that. Don't give a shit. I even felt bad at the fucking Saddam Hussein fucking hanging. I felt bad seeing fucking Gaddafi get tortured. And these are bad men. I'm not going to see some fucking guy get his balls torn off by a pit bull. The reason I'm being dramatic and being quite explicit here is because that's what young people have had to deal with. No wonder they're terrified. No wonder they believe that cancelling and censoring and controlling everything is the way. And it's up to us, us people who are a bit older. We're not old yet. Not out of the game. Not over the hill. Still young and vibrant and vigorous. I hope. Um, it's up to us to remind them, guys, shut the fuck up. The adults are here. The grown-ups are here. Don't worry. We'll separate the wheat from the chaff, the men from the boys. That reminds me of a joke. I'll end it here. And like, look, to all my Greek viewers, I love Greece. I love the history of Greece. I love the history of the Spartans. My son is called Leonidas, but I'm going to end on a joke. How do the ancient Greeks separate the men from the boys? With a crowbar. Oh my god, let's stop it. I mentioned recently in a video in Manchester that I believe ignorance is our greatest enemy. And uh, that is true. Um, but what's, what's tied together with ignorance is fear. And uh, I think, you know... A few hundred years down the line, we won't quite have this antagonism between religion and science, this kind of war that's been raging. And it's kind of like a Hegelian dialectic in a way. Both sides cement into their positions. And you get scientists that start saying strange things, that there's no meaning to life, and it's all just uh, the movement of material. And they're saying it, it's matter, so it doesn't matter. Very strange. And religious people, like, when you see some of them, when they get dogmatic and furious and start demanding that laws are changed for blasphemy or they, they riot and kill people because someone's insulted this. I mean, in Pakistan, it's a big problem. If uh, there is a, a, a small, but a few hundred thousand uh, Christians in Pakistan, and, uh, when you know, they work as doctors, lawyers, whatever, street sweepers, there's every rung of society you get Christians. And uh, if you're a Muslim in uh, Pakistan and you want to get your fucking Christian rival taken away to the gulags, you just say he or she insulted Islam. Happens all the time. There was a disgusting one a few years ago, I think it was in Lahore in uh, Pakistan, where um, some guy, I don't know if he's atheist or Christian, he, he got in some argument. And uh, his uh, classmates at the university went and told all the bloody yobos in the local town that he'd insulted the prophet. And on video, they went to his dormitory room, dragged him out and beat him to death. And they're all screaming, God is great. God is great. And like, you know, it's not, it's every religion. I mean, Jesus, the Buddhists, the peaceful Buddhists, you know, peace and love, the fucking machine gunning Rohingya Muslims in Burma. Or do we call it Myanmar? You know, Christians don't exactly have a fucking clean track record. If just one very small country, smaller than Scotland in population, we'll look at Ireland and what the Christians there did to little boys and little girls and how corrupt and disgusting and abusive it became. You know, like uh, not just Ireland, not just America, but uh, the Catholic Church became synonymous with raping little boys. And like, wow. Wow, how that, you know, so no one's innocent. We are all guilty. And what's tied in very closely with 
ignorance is uh, fear. If you're ignorant of things, you're going to be scared. If you're ignorant of things, you're not going to trust them. You're going to be scared. And like, of course, there's always the leap of faith, but it's called a leap. And they put faith in there because it doesn't always work. You could die. There is a risk. Now, let's first of all find the similarities between two Abrahamic prophets. Okay, let's look at Muhammad and Islam and we'll look at Jesus Christ. Now, they are very different in many ways, but I want to talk about one thing which they share in very strong common. Now, that was both their courage and their mercy. Now, the historical and nar the narrative account of Jesus as a merciful, all-loving, all-forgiving figure is quite set. Now, for Muhammad, I have read most of the Quran. I've not finished it yet. Um, I've read a bit about Muhammad and his life. And there were times where he did show mercy, but there were other times when he showed wrath. And, uh, you know, as... As the psychologist Jordan Peterson did in one of his lectures, he talked about how Muhammad was a warlord and Jesus, what, what you can say about him, he was definitely not a warlord. Muhammad was a very successful general. Now, look, let's stop with the differences for a minute. What Jesus and Muhammad shared was a very strong conviction in who they were. And also, they shared incredible courage. I mean... To conquer lands from your enemies that have decided you're a piece of shit and deserve to die, that takes courage. To um, tell all the Pharisees and the Romans that you're the son of God, that you're the, the king of all men, when the Pharisees, the Jewish people, were demanding that you were like descended from David, you're going to be the Jewish king and lead them into freedom and you're going to be amazing for the Jews. And then you kind of like trick them, not trick them, but you kind of deceive them. You're like, sorry, I'm not the king of the Jews. I'm the king of uh, all men. I'm the king of prostitutes. I'm the king of thieves. I'm the king of low lives. I'm the king of dirty sinners. I'm the king of crackheads. And uh, that took a great deal of balls, man. I mean, Jesus' balls, fucking giant brass fucking grapefruit hanging from his fucking groin. And, um, yeah, it may be very well the case that what sets prophets aside from us everyday fucking doubting scared people is courage you know so everyday normal people we've all got it in different amounts but i think we can all safely say that muhammad and jesus and i'm talking about them as historical figures i'm not talking about them as myth there's the man the myth the legend but there is evidence and whether it's authentic or not i don't know but talking about the historicity of Jesus and Muhammad as men, as men who walked and lived and shat and pissed and woke up and went to sleep and got pissed off. I mean, when I read the writings of Jesus, when I read what he said or what he stood for, it's faultless, guys. It's absolute... The things he said... Perfect. You cannot disagree with the things Jesus said about love, because it's true. As the sun is making me squint, as it's too bright to look at, the love that Jesus talked about is too bright to look at. It, it makes you emotional, it gets you, you start breaking up. And uh, it's interesting watching the psychologist Jordan Peterson talk about Jesus and love and courage he wells up he gets messed up he starts his voice is breaking he wells up he has to stop and um a big part of um i think where we've strayed from god is uh in the modern world with our our separatist identities everyone's black white you know homosexual straight or you're an ally of the woke or you're you're a nazi and i think that's terrible and i'll tell you a big victim of um of uh, this identity politics is uh, young men, younger than me, and I'm a, I'm a victim in a, in a sense, but I'm not going to go on about it, but young boys raised these days with the internet and, uh, you know, like terms such as rape culture and uh, we need to train men not to be rapists. I really, really hate the concept. I don't know where it came from, 
is it some warped Irish Catholic? But the concept of original sin, you know, or is that just Christianity in general? I don't know. I don't believe that shit. But uh, a lot of this identity politics, it says that maybe men, and especially young white men, are born with original sin, like they're born dirty and wrong. And I'm not talking in the kind of like honest sense that I'll say that we're all guilty of war and anger and having snakes in us and we're all a bit guilty of, you know, being a bit, you know, we're off the mark a bit, aren't we? I don't mean that. I mean, the way our culture, which has been completely hijacked, it's disgusting how we're we're in the middle of a cultural revolution. They are absolutely pulling out the carpet of what the West stood for. And they're replacing it with this kind of like globalist, I don't know, it's like, it is truly neo, neo-communism, but not neo-economic communism, neo-cultural and political communism. And they're telling young men, and not so much young black men, I mean, they're exalted in the, in the new normal, or young Indian men, young Chinese men, all exalted, but young white men, you are, I hate to say this, guys, but we are the new Jews. Now, this is very controversial to say this, but I, I 100% mean this. You know, you're, you're considered dirty and genetically wrong, and you've got war and slavery to, to atone for. And, like, it doesn't take into account that throughout history, most white people have always been peasants. 99% of white people. Hundreds of millions of them throughout history, peasants. You know, you see this, uh, this like a hundred acre estate I'm on with Floors Castle. It's the size of like five football fields. The house alone and the estate here. Do you think the people that swept the horse shit off the floor, those white people, 200 years ago, did they feel like they were on top of the game? I hate the fact I have to talk about white people or black people or cultural this or victim mentality or identity politics. I wasn't brought up like that, you know, wasn't brought up thinking of these things, but um, it's almost like when the, 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 the kind of this communism is taking part in order to remain human, you have to take sides. And I take the side of young innocent men who are being told that they're rapists. I take the side of whoever gets bullied and deplatformed or someone tells the truth that isn't even that controversial and they never work again or they get fired or it's not fair. And um, the only thing we can do guys, and this is what I really mean, courage, love, just speak your truth. Don't ever surrender. Never ever give up. One man, one kid, one woman with the truth against a horde of ideological maniacs is a majority. You stand with the truth. Look what they did to Jesus Christ. Every single thing that came out of his mouth, pretty much, was the truth. They killed him for it. Oscar Wilde said, if you want to tell the truth, you have to make it funny or they'll kill you. Let's just pause and let the van go past. All right, truck's gone past. Don't expect heavy machinery out in the countryside like this, but they're, they're doing all the roads at the back. Now, I just want to end it with a Shakespeare quote, very relevant to what I'm saying. The one thing which differentiates people like Muhammad or Jesus, and I'll, I'll talk about Jesus because I don't know enough about um, Islam, but um, how does it go, the, the Shakespeare quote? A coward dies a thousand deaths but the brave only taste of death once. Now, what that means in plain English is that every time you compromise your ideals or what you believe in for to be pragmatic or to be expedient is the right word, you die a little bit. A little bit of your soul of that love gets chipped away or necrotizes because... You can't be stubborn and like not be flexible. You have to be flexible. But with morality, I don't believe morality can ever be flexible. There are gray areas. There are situations, you know, like there's all sorts of dilemmas, moral dilemmas that I studied in philosophy. But there is always the right way. There is always what is the right thing to do. And uh, 
I guess what I'm trying to say is that I'm sick of dying small deaths. I'm sick of being asked to compromise my morality when uh, it seems like it's open season on uh, males, open seasons on males in the West. Stay strong, everyone. And uh, again, thank you so much for all your well wishes, your good wishes, your amazing messages. And I cried reading your messages. I was touched. And the fact that so many of you shared with me that my video, when I was upset, made you cry as well. Thank you. Guys, they've done it again. I can't drive out. They've sent the uh, worker van to block me in at the gatehouse of Flores Castle. Only kidding, they're not fucking arseholes here. They're nice people. This has nothing to do with me and I didn't come with a car. Let's go out.